Welcome to Harvest Mission Community Church. You are listening to one of our sermons. Turn to John chapter 6. And we're going to start reading from verse 22. And we're going to go all the way through verse 40. And as some of you probably have figured out by now, we're doing a three-part series. Uh, and we decided to start the series today. And that it will go into Easter and the week after. It's a three-part series that we're going to be covering. And we're simply calling it Undefeated. I think that word is such a powerful word when you think about who we are now in Christ. As you look around, you'll notice there are a lot of things that can make you defeated. Some of us, it might be situations or circumstances that we're facing in our lives. Sometimes it's the relational issues that we face quite often, whether it's at work, family, roommate situation, friends. There are so many things that it's easy for us to feel this sense of defeat. We get discouraged. We get depressed. We don't want to do anything. We get apathetic. These are things that we experience in our lives. But here's the truth. Because of Jesus Christ and what he has done for us on the cross, when he died on the cross, and he paid the penalty and the punishment of sin, he bore upon himself, and then he resurrected from the dead. That is the very reason why, if you are a follower of Jesus Christ, we have every single reason to be able to overcome whatever it is that we're facing in our lives. It is not, in some ways, just some kind of mental gymnastics that we do. It is not something that we numb ourselves with, but this is reality. And that is why no matter what we feel, what we experience, what through our senses here on this earth, there is a greater reality that enables us to be able to go forth and have this confidence and this hope. The three-part series that we're going to be covering is just we're going to talk about three important things. The first is simply undefeated in our purpose. That's what I want to talk about this morning, the sense of purpose, which I think every single one of us, we desire to know and to understand. Next week during Easter, we're going to be talking about undefeated in our hope. Why is our hope much different from what the world tells us that we should put our hope in? And that's what we want to encourage people who have maybe never heard the gospel or who have been to church, but they've been hurt and they turned away. We're praying that God will speak to them with the eternal hope that we have that's in Jesus Christ. And lastly, the third part, we're going to be talking about this undefeated promise that God has given unto us and how we ought to live our lives. So that's going to be for the next three weeks. As we start from today, I want to talk about this idea of purpose. Now, I'm going to give you, as we start here, I want to give you a hypothetical proposition. And I want you to think about this for a moment, and I need you to be honest. And a lot, a lot of times I ask questions that are rhetorical, which does not require a response. But when you're, if you're falling asleep, you raise your hand for whatever reason, then you're going to look really bad. But today, I'm hoping that we will be able to be honest and show so I can see how many of us in this room that this is true of us. So here's the proposition. If money was not an issue... Now everyone's like, yes. You know, this, this, is, this is when you, you get everyone's attention because we're all strapped for money and trying to figure this out, right? If money was not an issue and you had time to travel the world for one year to find your purpose in life, I'm wondering how many of you would do it. Go ahead and raise your hand if that's you. You know, some of us, okay, a lot of us. Some of us are being a little bit sheepish, and we're like, eh, yeah, maybe. It's a proposition. Pastor Seth has something he wants to speak to us. Okay, so think about it. Money is not an issue, and time is not an issue, that you can literally travel around the world to find your purpose in life. How many of us would do it? And many of our hands went up. I think there are many people in this world that, is try- that are trying to find their purpose in life by pursuing after their passions and having more experiences in life. Now, I'm not against that. I think there's some truth to that. But here is what I'm going to argue today, and hopefully some of you can understand and some of you can even testify because this is what you went through in your life. When you make purpose about finding what is your purpose in life, 
when you make it all about yourself, when you focus on your talents, your gifts, and what you desire, oftentimes you will not be able to find that purpose. In fact, it becomes very elusive. And so what I'm going to try to help you to see is that it's not about my purpose, but it's about God's purpose. That inherently, as you get to know what the purposes of God God is in this world or his purposes are, that you will be able to then join him in his purpose while you use your gifts and talents and everything that God has afforded you, that you will use that to be able to then go along and with him to fulfill his purpose here in this earth. So by finding his purpose and understanding his purpose, you will find yours. But many of us, we try to find ours and then try to fit it into God's purpose. Amen. (laughs) See? People, we don't like to hear that kind of stuff, right? But this is the truth. That bottom line is... We try to find our purpose. Don't worry. If something happens, I'll be the first one to run out there, and I'll protect you guys. Don't worry. This is where Pastor Seth is no longer Pastor Seth. He'll be gangster Seth, okay? So uh, we'll, we'll, we'll take care of that stuff, all right? So once again, when we try to find our purpose in ourselves first and try to then kind of add it into what we think is God's purpose, you will not find your purpose. You're going to find discontentment. You're going to find disillusionment. Some of you are going to be very discouraged. But when you understand God's purpose, and then you align yourself to his purpose with all the experiences, gifts, and talents that God has given you, that is when you're going to find a sense of fulfillment, contentment, and passion, and zeal that you could get up every single morning and you realize you were destined for this. You were created for this. I think what I'm noticing now, especially a lot of people who are in the mid 20s, all the way up to maybe in the early 30s or even mid 30s, they're going through something called a quarter life crisis. Now, some of you are like, what is that? Some of you are like, that's me right now, because you know what that is. That midlife crisis, if some of you might have heard, is when you live your whole life. And let's say we're going to live up till 80 or 90 years old. You live most of your life, and halfway point, you realize, what am I doing? What, where am I putting all my time and my energy and my efforts? Is, is this all that it is to life? That's why a lot of people struggle with the midlife crisis in their 40s and 50s, because they're wondering, what are they doing? They don't have much time to live. How, why did they invest so much of their time and their life into something that didn't really amount to much? Yes, they have a lot of money. Yes, they might have the fame. Yes, they might have all the things that they might enjoy. But there's an emptiness in their heart. Now what we're finding out is that there are a lot of people who are in their 20s and 30s who study so hard when they're young because they're dreaming about going into that university. Sorry for those of you that your university was not your first choice right now, all right? So here you are, you are dreaming of going to a university. You're dreaming about what your life will be after you get that degree and then you study hard and you get the degree and then you realize it is not what you expected as you're working. So then your whole life begins to spin around. Let me just say this, your quarter life crisis is normal. And I don't even want to call it a crisis. It's just you finding yourself, right? Midlife is a little bit different because you've lived a big chunk of your life, 40, 50 years of your life, and you don't have that much more time to live. So here we are, many of us even in this room, that are going through a quarter-life crisis. What is my purpose in life? What is it that I'm called to do? Why am I doing the things that I'm doing right now? The funny thing, those of us who are in that category, which is a lot of you, you have now just somehow magically taken the word adult and adulthood, which is a noun, and you transfer that now into a verb. So now you use the word adulting. We are, trying, we are doing everything possible, and we are adulting. How can you take a noun and turn it into a verb? I guess that's possible because there's Google, and then you are now, we're going to Google it, right? So I, I get it. So some of us right now are trying to do this thing called adulting. And we're trying to live life, become an adult. We can't be like a little kid anymore and just enjoying the benefits what our parents give us. But now we have to 
get a job. We have to live. I think the thing that highlighted this, the quarter-life crisis and all that, is because back in 2006, uh, a bio, the woman named Elizabeth Gilbert, she wrote a book called Eat, Pray, and Love. How many of you read or seen the movie? Go ahead and raise your hand. Don't be shy. Go ahead. Yeah. Okay. Some of us still not want to be honest this morning. It's okay. God will deal with you throughout. The, okay. So it's okay. If you haven't, I think it will be helpful just to know what the world is thinking and how they think. This book, if you haven't read it yet, it has been translated to more than 30 languages. Now, any book that's translated more than like several languages, it's a popular hit. Over 30 languages, this book has been translated because it speaks to the heart of the person. It was on Oprah Winfrey's book club. You know what happens, right? You, you, here's the book. You're on her club, millions of dollars, right? It was on her book club. It was also in 2010, so about four years after, it was made into a movie called, after the book, Eat, Pray, and Love, starring Julia Roberts. So they got an A-lister to be in this movie. The book simply is, it's a memoir of a 34-year-old woman, and I mentioned Elizabeth Gilbert. She's the author, and she experienced this, who seems to have everything. She's highly educated, she is married, and she's a successful, she has a successful career, she's a writer. And in the midst of all this success, things started happening. She ended up getting a divorce. Uh, she started feeling unhappy with her life. And she got into a bad relationship, just a rebound relationship. And she was left all alone and devastated. And it was in this moment, as she was kind of thinking about her life and what is her purpose in life, what she did was she made a decision as she talked to her uh, boss in the company, the publishing company, and she asked them if she could write a memoir of her travels for one year. So as I was kind of doing some research on this, I realized that she spent four years, or excuse me, four months in Italy. And what was she doing? eating. So she was eating and enjoying life for four months. Wow, what a life, you know, just eating, enjoying the scenery, you know, the, the town, you know, Italy, you know, and so it's like gangsters, all that kind of stuff, you know, you got the, the football team and the food. So she, for four months, that's what she did. And then afterwards, for three months, she spent time in India to find her spirituality, which is pray. So four months in Italy, three months in India. And then she spent the rest of the year in Bali, Indonesia. And she ended up falling in love with a Brazilian businessman. Some of you are like, Bali, when can I go, you know? So... <laughs> So for a whole year, this is what she did. That's why she wrote, eat, pray, and love. For those of us who did not watch it, I'm going to show you the trailer. And there's some phrases in there that I think you should pay attention to because it is what I want to address this morning. So this is the movie starring Julie Roberts off the famous book, Eat, Pray, and Love, and you will get the essence of what this woman is trying to find. Let's watch it together. Who wants to sign up? <laughs> I want to talk about this as we talk about purpose, because my premise right now is we're approaching it the wrong way. The thing is this. I think this describes many of us not that we have done all those things, but we want to. We think to ourselves that somehow if we could just experience life, if we could go on that next trip, that somehow we're going to be able to find our purpose. And I want to tell you this, that is really escapism. That's why after a vacation, after you do your thing and you come back, your emptiness, your discontentment is still there. 
You could go to Thailand all you want. You could go to Vietnam all you want. You could go to Japan all you want. But you cannot run away from the fact that there is this lack of fulfillment, discontentment, dissatisfaction in your life. Now, once again, there's nothing wrong with going to some of these places. There's nothing wrong with vacationing. But some of us, in reality, we want to go to these places because we're looking for an adventure. We want, we want our souls to be alive. But in reality, the more we chase after these things, the more emptier we get in our lives. And I hope that there are some of us who can testify to the truthfulness of what I just said. Some of us, we think, if I could only get that job, and then you get that job, and you're excited for the first couple weeks or month, and then you realize there's an emptiness in your soul again. You think that somehow that relationship is going to really fill you. And so, yes, it's great. You have someone there you could talk to, somebody you could always depend on and count on. But then after a little while, there's this ache in your heart that still longs for something more. And you think it might be marriage. If we could only just get married, and I'm telling you right now, that feeling will not go away, even though relationships are great, marriage is great, because deep in your heart, what is really lacking it's the sense of purpose and why you exist here on this earth. That's why no amount of vacation, no amount of money, no amount of success, no amount of positions and title will ever fulfill your heart. I love what Jeffrey DeGroat said. He, he's kind of a clinical psychologist and he's trying to understand so many people who come in to his office or to his clinic with so many anxiety problems, depression, and different things that they're facing. And a lot of times they think to themselves, I've tried everything, but there's still emptiness in their heart. Listen to what he says. He says this. He says, from all his clinical experience, he says, when I meet with people in their 20s who feel lost, uncertain, and uninspired in their life. They often believe that if they make a change in their life, they will find direction, certainty, and inspiration. But unless these changes help someone leave a truly toxic situation, I often find that the person's unhappiness persists even after they make the change. If you are currently in a very toxic situation that is killing your soul, you're in a relationship that's very toxic. You are in a work environment because you decided to do it for fame and for the money. And you realize that it's killing your soul. It's killing who you are in your identity. Unless it is a toxic situation and then you make a change. That is the only instance that he's trying to clarify that you will be able to find greater happiness. But many who are in these different situations, the job, the relationship, their situation, just by changing and moving to a new city, moving to a new place. I will even go as far as moving to a new church. It is you in your heart that you have not dealt with that emptiness and the sense of purpose. That's why today I want to talk about being undefeated in our purpose and not starting with us but starting with God's purpose. So the one thing for this morning I want us to remember is that God's purpose for us is secure. He knows what he's doing. He knows us. His purpose for us is secure because God's plans will always endure. It will go beyond time. He will accomplish what he has purpose in life. So God's purpose for us is secure because God's plan will always endure. We just quickly turn to somebody next to you. If you don't know them, you can just say hi and just tell them what the one thing is. Will you do that? Amen. I'm going to highlight two things in this passage so that we can comprehend what God's purpose for us is especially as his purpose is secure and he will always, his purpose for us will, is secure because he will always accomplish and his plan will endure. 
Let me talk about the first thing as we look into this passage. The first point is this. When we want to really find a sense of purpose and be secure in the purpose he has for us, the first thing we have to do is that we must seek after Jesus. We have to seek after Jesus. Let me just go ahead and read verse 12, uh, 22 to 25. And that's kind of set the setting for us. And then we'll delve a little bit more into this whole idea of seeking after Jesus. This is what the Word of God says. On the next day, the crowd that remained on the other side of the sea saw that there had been only one boat there and that Jesus had not entered the boat with his disciples, but that his disciples have gone away alone. Other boats from Tiberias came near the place where they had eaten the bread after the Lord had given thanks. So when the crowd saw that Jesus was not there, nor his disciples, they themselves got into the boats and went to Capernaum, seeking Jesus. When they found him on the other side of the sea, they asked him, Rabbi, when did you come here? Let me just pause here and kind of give us, this is the context of what's happening in the story. You have to remember that this passage is not a standalone passage because it's connected to a, a story, a thread of what was happening. Earlier in John chapter 6, verse 1 through 21, there are several things that happen that makes this passage that we just read in the beginning make sense. What happened was that earlier we noticed that Jesus fed the 5,000. Some of you know that story where Jesus miraculously used these five loaves and two fish and multiplied it and literally fed 5,000. Now, they only counted men, so you include women and children. We're talking about tens of thousands of people that were fed through just five loaves and two fish. It was a miracle. So can you imagine, here you are hungry, and then there's only five loaves and two fish, and Jesus multiplied it, and it says that every person was filled. They were no longer hungry. Also, after that instance, what happened was that Jesus then told the disciples to go to the other side of the lake. And if you know the story progression, you will know it's after feeding the 5,000, what did he do? He walked on water. Another miracle. So there's a miracle of feeding the 5,000, and there is a miracle of walking on water. Now in verse 22, as we just read, we see that people thought that Jesus was still on that side of the lake, that he did not go across. Why? Because they noticed that one of the boats was still there. So they just assumed that the disciples went to the other side, and Jesus was still in that location. But then they looked around, they realized Jesus was not there, and then they heard that Jesus is now in Capernaum on the other side, so they got into their boats to follow Jesus. Now in verse 25, as we read, we find, we found, they found Jesus, but then they asked, and this is the question, Rabbi, when did you come here? Like, when did you get here? Because we thought you were there, but then we heard you were here, like, when did you get here? How, yeah, they're probably thinking, how did you get here? And they were surprised and wondering how Jesus got to A, from A to B. Now, the question we have to ask ourselves is this. Why were they so adamant about seeking after and finding Jesus? And you will not be able to know unless you connect those two previous stories together. Because what you're going to find out in the next several verses is that you're going to see the true motive of these people. Are they genuinely seeking after Jesus because of salvation? Or are they seeking after Jesus because something about themselves? So let me talk about this as we're talking about how we must seek after Jesus. If you really want to find your purpose and to be able to line up with God's plans and purposes here on this earth. The thing that I want you to notice that we have a couple things we must be aware of. The first thing is this. Our purpose has to be exposed. Oftentimes, you will not realize how bad things are or where you're headed unless someone tells you. As I've shared many times before, you will never know you have a black pepper stuck in your tooth that looks really ugly unless someone sees you, and if they love you enough, just go, or like, there's something in your tooth, man. Or 
There have been many situations that there might be something on your body, your face, that you're not aware of because you do not have a mirror to look at, but someone sees it and they're able to tell you. Can I just say something that helps us to understand? Some of us, because either pride or insecurity, because we don't want to hear any, anything negative or anything constructive, you are living in a little world where it's all about you and there's no one who is able to speak to your life to say something's wrong. That's why you sit there, it's like, why am I always struggling with this? Why is it that I'm not able to do this? Why is it that I'm not chosen as a leader? Why is it that I have relational problems, that everyone has problems with me? Why is it that I'm always anxious in this situation? Do you know why? Because you don't have anyone in your life to tell you there is something wrong. Because who wants to hear, hey, dude, you got to work on that thing. That's why you don't have that many friends. That's why you're not getting promoted. That's why you're not able to do certain things. On the flip side, some of you who are very talented, you think that somehow that in your talent, you somehow are going to offer it to people and say, look at me. But I'm going to tell you right now, you could be the most talented person in this room. But if your character and your heart is not in the right place, it doesn't matter what talent you have. You're going to rub people the wrong way. So here are these people who had this motive of seeking Jesus, but the question is, why are they seeking Jesus? For what reason and for what purpose? And we see now their motives are getting exposed. Look at verse 26. Listen to what it says in verse 26. Jesus answered them, Truly I say to you, you are seeking me, not because you saw signs, but because you ate your fill of the loaves. Wow. Oh, Jesus, we missed you. You're not seeking me because of the sign of salvation, but because your stomachs are full. And you, wanna, you want me to continue to be your sugar daddy. That, I mean, that's my version, but you don't want to, you get the picture. Mm. Come on, Jesus. He starts off the phrase and he says what? Truly, truly, I say to you. Whenever you hear truly, truly from Jesus, what he's saying is, I'm going to say something really important to you. You better pay attention. Jesus exposed their hearts by telling them that their purpose of seeking him was not for any spiritual reasons, but rather it was just that physical needs were met. The people liked the fact that Jesus provided free food. Oh, sounds like life group sometimes, right? It's like, oh, I got to have friends. Oh, I get to kind of hang out because I don't do anything on Tuesday or Wednesday. Wednesday. But as soon as we ask for a commitment, it's like, whoa, 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 whoa. Here's a message translation of that verse. It says this. Jesus answered, you've come looking for me not because you saw God in my actions, but because I fed you, filled your stomachs, and what? For free. We all love free stuff. Come on, Jesus. You know we, we love free stuff because it's all about us. We don't have to put any commitment, any sacrifice. As long as it's free and we get to benefit from it, I'm, I'm all for that. But as soon as I have to give up myself, I have to sacrifice a little bit, I'm busy. I think in many ways, it's a rebuke of their motives. And I think this is a rebuke of our motives when it comes to purpose and seeking after Jesus. In many ways, they were seeking after Jesus for their own benefit. They had no understanding of the spiritual nature of these miracles of feeding the 5,000, that Jesus alone, he's, he's the provider, that we trust in him, that he walks on water to give us faith to believe that he's powerful, even controlling the, the, the waves and the water around him. He is the Lord of the universe. They experienced the miracle, but they failed to understand the spiritual significance. When our hearts are exposed, because of the false motive of why we do things, why we read the Bible, why we go to life group, why we come out on Sunday, why we pursue after different things. Once it's exposed, we get to clearly see more 
of what really is our purpose, just purely by our action. You know, I, I, this is something I talk about with many people all the time, during counseling sessions, during different, it's this idea of purpose. And I think we have done such a disservice to the church and the body of Christ, where somewhere along the line, maybe, maybe it was in the 90s or maybe it was in the early 2000s, we started writing these books and writing these songs that made it all about us. So we believe that we are the center of the universe, that God has to do things for us. And I'm telling you, he has to do nothing for you. He owes you nothing. You owe him your life. And somehow we believe that this is my life. I want to live it the way I want, but I'm going to praise you, God, but it's my life. I always get amazed at how so many people can take something that is so self-centered and they're, you can totally tell by their actions, the things that they say, their heart has been completely exposed. You see it for what it is. But they're so good at hiding behind Christian knees, like Christian phrases, or they try to do all these good works to look pretty good in front of people. So, for instance, if they want to be successful and have, they have no desire to love God or to even reach out to the colleague, but it, it, it's really their desire to have a certain position or a certain kind of income. Once again, there's nothing wrong with that, but it's your motive. But their motive is all about themselves. So you know what they'll do? Oh, I'm, try, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna take this new job or I'm gonna take this new position. I'm gonna try to do this because, you know what? I wanna reach out to my colleagues. Oh. Huh. Now, I have to guard my heart because I, I know as a pastor, I should not be cynical. So Lord, pure heart, pure heart. I, I, I have to pray that. But I look at their lives and the job that they had before, they didn't even reach out to anybody. That somehow magically would sing an extra zero after they pet check, that they're going to be more evangelistic and reach out to their colleagues. That's just Christianese to make people feel like, oh, okay, you're reaching out to your colleagues. Or it could be anything that we do to justify ourselves, to make ourselves look good, but in reality, your motive is completely set on yourself. So unless your heart is exposed and you see your heart for what it is, and you start, stop justifying and making excuses for the bad motive, and you humble yourself before God, and you allow people to speak those truths into your life, I'm telling you right now, you are going to be on a journey of emptiness and discontentment and dissatisfaction. How do we know this? Because later on in the story, which we're not going to read the full story, but I want to read you a snippet of some of these verses that happens after Jesus told them where their real motives are. John chapter 6, verse 44 through 64 through 66. Listen to what it says. But there were some of you who did not believe, for Jesus knew from the beginning who those were who did not believe and who it was who would betray him. Verse 65, and he said, this is why I told you that no one can come to me unless it is granted him by my father. After this, this is the important verse. After this, many of his disciples, what do they do? Say this with me. They turn back and no longer walk with him. This is what happens when your heart is not exposed and you bring it before Jesus and to the cross. I have seen so many people come to Christ. It's not because they realize how sinful they are and how awesome God is and he is holy and the wrath of God is upon them. But they come to Christ because I love community. They're so nice to me. And there's nothing wrong with being nice. Some of you are like, okay, then I'm going to be mean. Thank you. Thank you, Pastor, for giving me permission to be mean to that person. No. You got to be loving. You got to be nice. You got to be able to reach out to people. But the reason why some of us come to Christ is because everything was for ourselves. We have friends, we feel good. People love us, care for us, they served us. 
So their motive for coming to Christ is not because of the gospel, not because of they understand who they are without Christ and who they are now in Christ. They have based their Christianity off all the other stuff that should not base your salvation on. That's why when the trial comes, that's why when situations come, that's why when there's conflict, that's when you're just apathetic, what do they do? They turn away. Now, that doesn't exclude them from the grace of God because I believe God can bring them back. But they turn away. Because why? Because their true heart motive is exposed. Why they were following Christ. Why they were part of life group. Why they served in the church. Why they did all these things. It is exposed now. Because it's not what they want. I think this is true for many of us. I know because counseling people, talking with and I'm not trying to pick on any of you. I'm just saying this is what sometimes kills your soul. So not only... Once the purpose be exposed, why you're doing, why, why are you seeking after Jesus? That has to be exposed. But the second thing is you have to understand that our pursuit has to be, must be eternal. Let's read verse 27. Listen to what it says. Do not work for the food that perishes, but for the food that endures to eternal life, which the Son of Man will give to you. For on him God the Father has set his seal. Jesus continues to speak to the, the truth to the people after he says, you're just following me because I fed you and you got bread and fish for free. He now says to work for food that does not spoil or perish. What he's simply saying is there are things that are temporary and there are things that are eternal. And he's trying to argue that you should chase after the things that are eternal. That all your efforts... All your pursuit should always be towards the things that will last forever. I've said this many times before, but it doesn't matter how much money you have. You cannot take it with you when you die. That's why you will always donate it to someone and put your name there, somehow thinking that it will last forever. And it might not. Fire, things will burn down. You know, you just... But here we are, slaving over the work Doing all these things. I mean, I, I passed that high school stage and the college stage, and I'm going to tell you right now, your GPA will not matter. I, I know, hold on, hold on. I, I know some of you are getting really antsy now. Some of you are happy. You're like, huh? It doesn't matter? Oh, thank God. My 2.0. Oh, uh, praise Jesus. It's amazing how I can make one comment and two different people respond different ways. I'm just going to let it marinate there for a while. Some of you, your whole life is consumed with your studies. Now, we, you know us. We encourage you to do well. You're not going to be able to get a hearing or be a good witness if you're the lowest in your class. No one's going to listen to you. Do well. But the question is, why do you do well? There are some of you who are working so hard because you want a, a greater promotion. You want to try to move up the corporate ladder. Is there anything wrong with that? Of course not. That means more influence. We're all about influence. That's what leadership is. It's all about influence. But at the end of the day, You might impress some people, but sometimes the people who matter the most to you won't even care. That's what I have said here in Asia, and I'll say it again. And even those who are watching it around the world, I'm, I'm going to say this to you. When you so focus on skills of things that you could obtain. If it is not going to help you to accomplish eternal things, in many ways, you're going to get to a point where there's going to be a sense of unfulfillment and discontentment. Not to say those things are evil or bad in and of itself, but listen, it is because you are trying to 
search or chase after that to fulfill your heart, thinking that somehow you're going to have a sense of greater purpose. And I'm telling you, you have to seek after Jesus. And not only do you have to seek Jesus, but the way you seek him is with your heart being exposed, your motives being exposed, and the things that you are pursuing after, it has to be eternal. That's why Jesus wanted people to pursue after the spiritual food, which is Christ himself. That's why he taught this before. In Matthew chapter 4, verse 4, he says, Man shall not live by bread alone, but every word that comes from the mouth of God. Listen to the message translation. It takes more than bread to stay alive. It takes a steady stream of words from God's mouth. That's what feeds us. That's what sustains us. How about us this morning? What are some of the things that you're pursuing in your life? Is it something temporal or is it something eternal? I'm wondering if you're able to even see your own motives. Do you understand your own heart? In fact, I could answer that for you. The Bible tells us in Jeremiah that no one can understand their heart because it's wicked, it's evil. That's why we need other people to speak into us. We need to spend time with God. Let him reveal things to us. I'm wondering if some of us have become a Christian, if some of us are participating in life group, some of us are coming out on church, some of us are serving in ministry teams due to our self-centered purpose rather than seeing the beauty of the gospel. We must seek after Jesus. Let me close with the second point. We must not only seek after Jesus, but we have to surrender to Jesus. After Jesus tells the people to work for food that does not perish, and how he points that he's the only one who can give this food that will last for eternity. It's interesting that the people respond with a desire to turn to themselves. It's, I, I really believe when you, when you read it from that kind of perspective, you realize how self-centered we are as people and how Jesus is so patient with us. We see it all that. Just read the Gospels. How many times people will try to say something and that Jesus will retort and come back with something and then they're trying to do something else to try to prove themselves. And then you see Jesus, those that are lost, hurting, that he has patience with them and compassion upon them. Those who are proud, self-sufficient, self-centered, he comes pretty strong to expose that so they can humble themselves and turn to God. That the burden that they're carrying is heavy, but his yoke is light. That's why he says, come and learn of me. Because I am humble and meek of heart. Jesus now tries to help them to understand that by placing their trust in him, they will have this eternal food that will not perish. And this will help us to understand a little bit more about purpose. So as we seek after Jesus, and then now we surrender to Jesus, listen to how he builds his argument. There are two specific reasons why we must surrender ourselves to Jesus rather than turning to ourselves. The first thing is this. Only God can supply everything we need. He is our supplier. He's the only one that can supply the sense of purpose. He's the only one that can give us a sense of accomplishment, even love in our hearts. It's God himself, God the Father, he is the one who supplies. I'm going to go read verse 28 through 34 as we continue in this story. Then they said to him, what must we, I want you to say that word, what is that two-letter word? Do. What must we do to be doing the works of God? Jesus answered them, this is the work of God, that you believe in him whom he has sent. So they said to him, then what sign do you do that we may see and believe you? What work do you perform? Our fathers ate the manna in the wilderness. As it is written, he gave them bread from heaven to eat. Jesus then said to them, truly, truly. So once again, he's saying something important. Truly, truly, I say to you, it was not Moses who gave you the bread from heaven, but whom? But my Father gives you the true bread from heaven. For the bread of God 
is he who comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. They said to him, sir, give us this bread always. Clearly, the people understood work to be something that they had to earn before God. It's like a righteousness before God, that they had to do something. They had to earn it. In fact, in verse 28, as we just read, I'm going to read it to you in the NIV, the New International Version. It says this, they asked him, what must we do to do the works of God, or works, the works God, and here's the word, requires. Like we always want to meet up to that line. We want to hit that level. What is it that we must do, and what is the requirements? Because I want to be able to fulfill it. So what if your good works of righteousness, you're looking good in front of people, is like trying to jump from TST over to Wan Chai, crossing the Victoria Harbor? Some of you, your legs are strong. Some of you have like that lanky body that when you jump anywhere, you just seem to fly, right? Some of you will go a little bit further than others. Some of us may be a little bit, you know, it's hard. And so we just like take one step and we just drown. Whether you take a step or whether maybe you have gone maybe even two meters or three meters, the reality is all of us will fall short. We will not in one, even running up as fast as we can after we jump off from TST Harbor to go all the way over to the Victoria Harbor. I'm telling you right now, we will fall short. That is the reality. Because God is so holy, there is no one that can achieve and to be at a point where they can be righteous before God. The Bible tells us that all of us have sinned and we have fallen short of the glory of God. That it is not through our righteousness because they are like filthy rags before God because he is completely, 100%, absolutely, ultimately pure and holy. There is nothing that we do that can stand in presence of the holiness of God. And this false belief that these people had, that somehow they could please God and that they could earn eternal life by doing all these good works, this is the very thing that the Apostle Paul was trying to address to the Jewish people. So if I could put it in the modern day, this is what people are trying to address to those people who have gone to church all their lives. You know I love you. But all I can say is those of you who are very churched, you grew up in a church, we could praise God because he protected us. He gave us the gospel at an early age. Praise God for that. But at the same time, there's a sense of smugness or like entitlement. Like because you grew up in the church, like you somehow are more self-righteous. You see it in life groups. You see it in the subtle groups, right? People are just talking and sharing vulnerably, and they go, well, in this passage, you know, this person is really, watch out for those people. Now, I'm not against information, but it is not going to bring transformation. It's just head knowledge. So they know a lot, but when you look at their private lives, when you look at who they are, you totally tell the things that they know here is not transferring to how they live their lives. Something is off. The more you know Jesus, the more loving you will become. The more you know Jesus, the more patient you will be. The more you know Jesus, the more generous you will be because you realize how much he has given to you. The more you know Jesus, the more forgiving you will be. Those of you who are holding bitterness and those of you who are almost contemptuous looking at people and saying, I'm better, I'm telling you, you do not understand the gospel. You know it here, but you don't know it here. So you could talk all you want, thinking that somehow that's going to give you positions and titles. I'm telling you right now, we smell that out. We're not going to buy that. I'm not going to buy that. It is your life, how you live. Because your life has been affected by the gospel. It doesn't mean you're going to be perfect. But when you understand the gospel from here to your heart, it breaks you. It literally melts your hardened heart. 
the people that you could not love, you're going to start loving because you realize that Jesus loved you more than you deserve. The people that you cannot forgive because they've hurt you, you will begin to be able to forgive because God has forgiven you. With those sins that you have committed, when no one else is watching, he has forgiven you. That you're not above forgiveness. You need it just as much as that person over here. That's why those who understand the gospel in their hearts, their life will be different. And I'm going to say this to you. You will see the fruits. Huh. You don't even have to know them. You will see their fruits. You can fake it, of course. But you can't fake it for long. It's just too tiring to love people that are unlovable. It is just too hard to be able to forgive people and say you've forgiven them when they remind you of all the pain that you've experienced. It's just too hard. You cannot do it on your own strength. You cannot earn salvation. You cannot earn righteousness. So what does Paul say say in Romans 10, verse 2 and 4? He says, for I bear them witness that they have a zeal for God, but not according to knowledge. So they're excited, they're passionate about things of God, but once again, it it is not based on true knowledge, understanding the gospel. For being ignorant of the righteousness of God and seeking to establish their own, so they want to build their own righteousness because they don't know the righteousness of God that has been purchased through Jesus Christ. For Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone who believes. You read that like, okay, but you know, (laughs) I like the -the down-the-earth version. Keep it real. So here's a message translation of Romans chapter 10, verse 2 and 3. I readily admit that the Jews are impressively energetic regarding God. I'm going to add a little bit of my translation. They go to, they go to Monday morning blessing. They, uh, they go to a life group. They serve a lot. They're in salt. They do all this stuff. They are impressively energetic regarding God. They are the guardians of the truth. So when they're in how to go, that's false. You don't know your Bible. Let, let me explain to you. Okay, enough of my SKV, but let's go back to the message translation. But they are doing everything exactly what? Backwards. They, it says here, they don't seem to realize that this comprehensive setting things right that is salvation, it's God's business, and a most flourishing business it is. Right across the street, try to picture this, Central, Temple Street, okay, try to picture this. Right across the street, they set up their own salvation shops and noisily hawk their wares after all these years of refusing to really deal with God on his terms, insisting instead on making their own deals, they have nothing to show for it. Here's a shop that you could earn salvation, or excuse me, you could gain salvation through Christ. It's free. But we decide to open up shop right across, and then we sell our own things, try to earn. And that is the picture that Paul is trying to give to us, that we are trying to do things on our own. But the Jewish people, or these people who are following Jesus, they still wanted to see a sign. That's why it is so interesting that they said, what sign are you going to show us? Because our fathers, our forefathers, God showed us the sign of the manna from heaven. That's how we knew that it was God. Because as we were in the wilderness, this manna came down and that was surely God. And here's Jesus in verse 32 and 33 as we read. He says, that bread that the Israelites received, it wasn't because from Moses, but it was from God himself. He is the source. He is the supplier of that bread. And God still, even today, is the one who's giving us bread, who is the life to us through Jesus. What I want you to understand is that purpose in life does not come from you. Does not come from someone telling you what you should be doing. It comes from God. He is the one who will supply that purpose that you so long and crave after. 
That's why these people, when they were listening, what did they say in verse 34? Sir, give us this bread. So now they're hungry spiritually. Now they want to know. And then in verse 35 through 40, as we close out here, this idea of surrendering to God, surrendering to Jesus, it is only God who can fully satisfy. Not only is he the supplier, but he is the satisfier. As the people were asking for this bread that is from heaven and that gives life to the world, Jesus responds by saying what? I am the bread of life. Jesus was not talking about physical food, but spiritual food. Just like the physical food nourishes our bodies, Jesus, who is the bread of life, will nourish the spiritual life. So let me just read verse 35 through 40. Jesus said to them, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me shall not hunger, and whoever believes in me shall not thirst. But I say to you that you have seen me and yet do not believe. All that the Father gives me will come to me, and whoever comes to me I will never cast out. For I have come down from heaven not to do my own, come on, say this, will, not my own will, not my own purpose, but the will of him who sent me. And this is the will of him who sent me, that I should lose nothing of all that he has given me, but raise it up on the last day. For this is the will of my Father, that everyone who looks on the Son and believes in him should have eternal life, and I will raise him up on the last days. We get now the picture of what it is that Jesus is trying to say. You're trying to earn your salvation. You're trying to do your own thing, live your own life, have your own purpose. It doesn't come from you. It comes from God the Father, who not only can supply that for you, but he will be the one who will fully satisfy you. Jesus continues, and he says that no one, as we read in verse 35, anyone who comes in will never hunger and never thirst again. He's the only one that can satisfy our hearts and our longings. You want to find your purpose because you want significance in your life. You want to find purpose in life because you realize the things that you already experienced, it doesn't fully satisfy. And here's Jesus saying, I am the only one that can satisfy. You will never hunger and you will never thirst ever again. But as some of you know, the problem is in verse 36, but I said to you, I said to you that you have seen me and yet do not believe. So many things that we see but we lack the faith. Even faith God has to initiate in us. Verse 37 through 40, as we just read, we see that Jesus clearly understood his purpose here on this earth, the will of the Father. How many times do you see this over and over? I'm just going to highlight it for you. Look at John chapter 6, verse 38 and 40 once again so that you understand. And that when you see the yellow parts, can you just say it with some conviction and out loud so that we will hear it? Turn to that person next to you and say, are you ready? Okay, are you ready? All right. Here we go. For I have come down from heaven not to do my own will, but the will of the Father who sent me. And this is the will of him who sent me. And I should lose nothing of all that he has given me, but raise it up on the last day. For this is the will of my Father, that everyone looks onto the Son and believes in him, should have eternal life and I will raise him up in the last days. The will of him, the will of the Father, that's where we find our purpose. And that purpose is what we see even in the Great Commission, to go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything that I've commanded you. And surely I'll be with you always. Because when you do those things, the greater purpose of loving God and loving people will make sense. You want to find your specific purpose in life? You're going to be blinded by looking at and searching for that forever. But you look at loving God and loving people, and that means to go and make disciples of all nations. And you order your life towards that direction and that purpose in life. I'm telling you right now, that's when you're going to start seeing oh, I get to love God, love people, make disciples through this particular 
career. Not like, what do I want to do? What is my career? But when you focus on his purpose, the will of the Father, that is when you will be able to then discover how you can use your gifts and talents, everything, so that that will will be accomplished. In John chapter 6, verse 39, as we read, I love this message translation. Listen to what it says. This, in a nutshell, is that will, that everything handed over to me by the Father be completed. Will you say this word with me? Not a single detail missed. And at the wrap-up of our time, of time, I will, I have everything and everyone put together upright and whole. He's not going to miss anything. He knows your heart. He knows your passions. He knows your giftings. He's the one who gave you the experiences. Every detail of your life, he knows. Will you trust him? Will you surrender your life to him as you're seeking after Jesus? Then make it about him and that he will bring it to completion. St. Augustine, in his book Confessions, he wrote this. Thou hast made us for thyself, O Lord, and our hearts are restless until they find their rest in thee. That our hearts will always be restless unless we find our true rest and our purpose in him. How about us this morning? I'm wondering if some of us have our own agendas or are we fully and completely surrendered to God? Do we really believe that God is the one who can satisfy us or are we turning to other things in this world that will leave us empty and disappointed and disillusioned? Do you have faith that God is the one who will supply everything that you need? I know sometimes this message might be for those of us who are younger and still trying to discover, but how about some of us who are older? What the same principles apply Because if your whole life has all been about you and you're going through a midlife crisis, then what God might be challenging you is not necessarily give up the job or give up that thing that you have, but what he's trying to challenge us is can we reorient our purpose to now say, God, you have already blessed me with these things. How do I use it for your purpose and your glory? That's why this is simply the gospel. That Jesus obeyed the will of the Father to come to this earth to live the perfect life that you and I could not live. And he did it so well because we always fall short. We do not love people the way Jesus loved. We do not do things in purity the way Jesus does. That's why we need a Savior. And he knew this as it was the will of the Father, his purpose here to come to this earth. And then he died on the cross, even though he could have called upon a thousand angels to destroy all those people mocking him. He could have come down in a snap of a finger and show his power to everyone, but he still hung up on the cross. He hung there on the cross because he's thinking about the will of the Father, the purpose that he had. And then he died, rose again from the dead. So now that we ourselves find our purpose in his purpose. And that's why we surrender our hearts, surrender our lives to Jesus, and we continue to seek him. Not our own purpose, but we seek him, and he will lead us to that purpose. That's why the one thing, once again, is that God's purpose for us is secure because God's plans will always endure to the end. May we be part of his greater plan, and he will show us what our purposes are. I'm going to just encourage us with a few things here as we think about some next steps. The first thing is this. you got to be in God's word. you got to be in God's word because that's how you're going to understand his heart. That's how you're going to understand his purpose. Some of you are wondering, what is my purpose? What, what is, but you haven't even read the word. Read the word and you're going to see his purpose, that thread that goes through from Genesis all the way through Revelation. And you realize this is God's purpose. Now I'm going to align myself to that purpose. Be in God's word. Secondly is be in God's community. You cannot 
find out God's greater purpose or even discover the things that God is blessing you with so that you can use it for God's purpose if you're not in community. There is no silos or people who are by themselves that are going to find out the true purpose of God. you got to be in community and to practice and to do the things that God desires for you to do. Be in community. I know many of you in this room right now are in a life group. But there's a difference by being there physically but absent in your heart. Some of us are not making it a priority because it might be like a list of do's and don'ts. But if you understand how desperately you need other people because God has created you for relationships, God has created you for community, you realize that even when the day is long and you're tired, you don't want to go to life. But even though you have a lot of other things you got to do, just say, I'm going to take a pause about two hours just to be in community. Because what happens? Oh, I'm so busy. I can't go. And guess what we do that evening? We end up playing video games. Watch. So we could have gone, but we just don't want to go. And that's what I want to challenge some of us. You just wasted two, three hours doing something when that time could have been used and committed. So you're still at the same place, maybe even worse. When by being a community, you could experience more of God. You could be blessing people because it's always blessed to give than to receive. So when you give of your presence, when you give of your time, when you give of your vulnerable sharing, you are the one who will receive. You'll be more energized and can go back and do the things that God has called you to do for that day and for the rest of the week. Be in God's community. Let's stop making excuses. And the third thing is this, be in God's presence. Be in God's presence. Because at the end of the day, the more you are in his presence, the more you understand his heart, the more you understand what he desires for you and I to do. Spend time with him. It doesn't always have to be in a room and you sit there on on the chair or on your knees, but even as you're walking. I've been challenging some of our leaders. Do you know how long it takes to go from floor one to ver- uh, floor 22? Does anyone know? Depends on if it stops at floor 11, right? There's a lot of happening stuff there. <laughs> but think about your apartment. But Pastor, I live on the third floor. Well, then praise the Lord, you have 10 seconds. But some of us who live on higher floors, do you know that that space in that elevator, that his presence is there with you and you can fellowship and commune with him, even if it's only for 49 seconds or 56 seconds, that that small brief moment you're acknowledging the presence of God and that he will give you perspective before you go. Even as you're walking, instead of checking the phone, maybe you could just spend time praying before you go to that meeting. That will help you to focus and be in his presence. To say, God, I'm doing this because this is your purpose that you've given to me. I want to close with this short one minute and some second video. Ryan um, Bomberger, his story is pretty impactful because he and his wife, they started something called the Radiance Foundation. And this foundation is pretty much trying to promote adoption just, just within the churches and just different communities. The reason why he's so passionate about it is because he himself was adopted. As an African-American, and there was a, a couple who had their own three kids, but then they ended up, I think, adopting six other kids, and he happened to be one of them. They had the United Nations, you know, And they did a tribute to his father. It seemed like he was an incredible father. And he shares his story. He shares his story that as a person who did not know who his real biological parents were. He shared his story about how he literally, when he came to some kind of understanding, the thought is, why did my parents not want me? Struggling with his identity, struggling with just trying to understand and make sense. But because he's in this environment where He experienced Christ in a very personal way through his parents, through the brothers and sisters, in this community of family, that he really began to grow in his identity and most of all in his purpose because he understood the heart of the Father. 
And this video is going to be kind of not like the other videos that I've shown, but pretty much it's a video with just words. And the words that you begin to see are all the things that he does or titles that he has and the things that he's able to do. And the reason why he's able to do it is because he has been loved and accepted by God. When you understand some of the basic purposes and what God has done for you, I'm telling you right now, there, it doesn't matter what you end up doing in life. He will use you for something that's great. So I pray that as we just watch this, read the words, maybe something that inspires us. It doesn't matter what kind of background you're from, what you have experienced. Because there are people who experience worse things. But they're living for the purposes of God. May that be true of us. Let's watch this together as we close. Thank you for listening to the Harvest Mission Community Church Podcast. For more information, visit our website at hongkong.hmcc.net.